Vicky Evans. And I'm Tegan Bins. And welcome to the Boom Tunes Podcast. Welcome to episode two of the Boop Tunes podcast. And today, first of all, it's been announced that Busted are going on tour. So exciting. <laughs> exciting. Yes. Tegan's still here. Hi. <laughs> uh, do you think we'll get to that, Tegan? I feel like we will. I feel like it's going to be difficult because um, mm. they're already sending out pre-sale. Um, what do you call it? access codes um and i feel like it's going to be big with it being the 20 years and um because is it charlie yeah he's backing it now isn't he so yeah yeah it's gonna be big yeah but hopefully we'll get an episode on that yes hopefully fingers crossed and as for music for this month i've been to see sleeping with sirens and yours truly and who have you been to see um, I saw this month Young Blood. No, that was last month, wasn't it? Yeah, I think it was. Yeah, I don't think I've been to see any this month. Um, I think it was last month, but I don't think we spoke about them. So, Young Blood in 1975. It's fine. We're a month nice. off. Both my concerts were like last minute journalist job. Can you get to Leeds and review this in a few days? Yours truly was really really good opened by south arcade and lizzie farrell 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 yeah but i'm never Farrell. confident in how i say it <laughs> you've I'm got like extra confident, confident now <laughs> uh, extra confident extra like scared now because when i was recording uh, editing even the last episode i was like i pronounce things really weird why <laughs> um but no, it, it was really, really good. Um, it was at the Key Club in Leeds. Main two issues with it was everywhere was advertising that doors were at seven and they were at half past, so we were standing in the freezing snow rain half an hour longer than we expected, and I stood at the back of the room um, with Matt, and we had someone continuously farting, Oh. And a group of very tall lads. And when I say a group, like they weren't a group together. There was just multiple very tall lads, easily the tallest men in the building. <laughs> and they just insisted on being wherever me and Matt were. Oh, and they yeah. were nudging and standing. And But other than that, it was a really good crowd. I used to go to the Key Club a lot. Mm. And I love keys. Yes, yes. Um, it was always a good crowd there. I don't... No, I, I tell a lie. I was going to say, I don't think I've had a bad gig there, but I have had one of my worst gigs there. Um, but that was the people I was with more than the gig itself. Um, but yeah, it, everyone was like really supportive. The, the show before had been postponed because um, I think she's called Michaela, the singer of yours truly. She was sick. And everyone was like, we hope you're better, you know. Um, both Lizzie Farrell and South Arcade are really good. And I recommend people talk about that. And I think we'll talk about that in another episode because I've got it planned where we talk about um, openers. Yes. That you've ended up like acts. really. Yeah. that's enjoying. It's similar to my young blood experience. Yeah, yours truly. Um, they seem like really nice people, and they're really talented. Um, there was like loads of fan interaction. There was loads of like a really good stage presence, a little acoustic set, and right at the very end, um, she stopped the show because someone had gotten hurt, and she like got that person out and, and someone home. safe. And I've seen loads of videos of that. I've never seen it in person. Yeah, yeah. It like it's always really nice when, when that happens. Yeah. Shows they actually care and they're not just 
Exactly, yeah. And they said, like, thanks for understanding, you know, if you're not okay, please let us know. And I was watching them afterwards, like, hugging fans, giving them their time. Aww. It was so nice to see. And the fact that the crowd as well was, like, really respectful towards them. Mm. It was, it, it put my faith back in humanity. <laughs> Unfortunately, my faith was left again, um, seeing Sleeping with Sirens. <laughs> so charming liars were the first band on that night they were really good really energetic um i was on photography and the singer like dropped his water bottle and i was like "Ooh, i'll get that for you and he was like cheers and i was like you're welcome because you know i'm british um but they were like very energetic talking to the band, talking to the band, talking to the audience. Static Dress was on after them. They were from Leeds. Um, not my cup of tea. They were very heavy and the singer moved at like a million miles a minute. Never stopped. They seemed to play in pitch black. The guitarist was dressed like a gimp Satan. And honestly, like, I was anxious. I was, like, in the front pit, and I was, like, I want my mum. <laughs> and then I was, like, doing the reading up afterwards, and they were all, like, ooh, it's art, it's art, it's art. And I was, like, I don't really care. Just play good music. And then Sleeping With Sirens were really, really good. Um... The audience weren't that great. I saw a lot of pushing. There was a lot of... Well, Matt got quite triggered because um, some masters were touching him up, which Mm -hmm. we will get on to concert etiquette later. I saw a lot of people leaving in tears. I saw a woman that... Like, she was holding her head as if she'd been punched. Oof. And this wasn't in the pit. Oh, God. Yeah. Um, so I left, like, well, I didn't leave. I went, like, right to the back, out the way. And I'm sure if I'd stayed in the pit, it would have been an amazing experience. But, you know, you stand at the back, you kind of lose the feeling of the music, don't you? Yeah, yeah. It's sort of but, away from the atmosphere and everything. Yeah. Um, but they they do put on a good show. They are really good live. Um Hopefully you get a better crowd than I did. And I've kind of rushed through that, but there we go. That's my two. That's you, yeah. So um, the first one I went to see was in 1975, I believe. Yeah. Um, they were quite good, to be fair. I've seen them a couple of times. I quite like them. Um, I know there's been controversies on and off with Matty. Um, it is what it is. Artists are controversial. Um but yeah, they the put on such a good show. They are very artsy. Um, I feel like it's more for aesthetic reasons than it is for making a statement. Um, I mean, he did eat raw meat on stage and all I could think of coming from a veterinary background was, God, I hope he's had his <laughs> tapeworm tablets before he's done this. <laughs> it really it triggered me. Um, but no, overall, it was a really good show. I can't remember who it was that was supporting um I feel like Bonnie Bonnie was her name um she's very similar to Biba Doobie who was signed on to Matty's record label um so he tends to do that he tends to pick up small artists that he likes same with Pale Waves he did the same with them he just gives them a starting boost because they're a well-known band and he knows people listen to them if they listen to them um if they listen to the other band, if they listen to 1975. Um, but no, she were really good, um, but sort of nothing new. Right, yeah. Um, again, I'm not, I, I listen to pop bands, obviously, I really like 1975. Um, but not my cup of tea. She was very talented, very good, um, but she was quite young, and you could tell. Um, not that she wasn't good on stage, but you could tell that she was quite skitty. It was a big arena. It was sold out. I would be the same, to be honest. 
Um, she were really good, but yeah, it were really good, really good set. Um, again, the only thing that ruined it was the crowd. They've blown up on TikTok. I feel like their fan base is a lot of younger people, especially mm. now that they've gone off on TikTok as well. Um, and I feel like you said that we will we will touch on it on a later later discussion. But fan etiquette at shows is a big issue for me at the minute. I found that it's yeah. not like it used to be. People. Are all gathering for the same reason but mm. they're just not it's just rude people are rude that's what i found a lot of pushing i was actually on crutches at this time um i shouldn't have gone to the show as it was standing but i did anyway because i'm insane <laughs> and i missed pierce the veil in december because i was bed bound so i weren't missing this one um and people were still rude so is what it is. Young Blood, sort of similar. I used to be a big fan of Young Blood. I sort of dropped off a little bit. Not that I like his music. He's a good musician, don't get me wrong. But I feel like again he caters to younger, sort of like teens that are struggling with identity stuff like that. And I still listen to him. He's he, like I said, he's a good artist. But it's sort of the novelty is worn off a little bit. Um, I think. I enjoyed his earlier music and the fact that it's from Donny, which is where I work. So it's really exciting because you don't get many big bands that um, are up and coming and get really, really famous from round our end. I think closest we have is Chef with like Arctic Monkeys, yeah. uh, Ring the Horizon, Pulp, right, stuff like I that. But they're that. older bands. Right, I saw Louis Tomlinson's film last night. There's all of those voices. And I was sobbing at a few points in it but then I, like, yeah. I was like you know what you don't get working class Doncaster making it big no on, lad. and it's a shame though because I know um, a lad whose uh, family knows my stepdad he's in yeah. a band they're playing uh, Little and actually just down road from us um, I think they're called Everglades um, it's a really good band he's such a good lad as well such mm. good musician and it's a shame that people like that don't get picked up as easily as other artists do. I feel like it's it's a faulty system where it artists get picked to, up that are very basic, um, but then the sorry. ones that are actually homegrown, grassroots, if that's the right yeah. term, um, yeah. don't get as famous and don't do as well, even though they're just as good or sometimes in, in cases better. But yeah, Young Blood was good. Um, his set were good. Again, artsy. I know there were controversy between them and 1975 actually, um, for taking some parts of the 1975 show and applying it to to his show. But I didn't see it. It was still artsy in the same sort of way. But I didn't really see a lot of similar. I'll speak. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Um, I didn't see a lot of similarities between the two shows having been to both. Um, so I don't know what happened there between them, but beef is beef. <laughs> People will beef no matter what. Um, I was Who so excited for the... Who would win a fight? Sorry? Who do you think would win a fight? Ooh. See, I'd have to go the scrappy Donny lad. <laughs> but I feel like Matty would be surprisingly... Um, I think he'd fight dirty. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we should make that a section. Who would win? <laughs> yes. We could have like a Twitter poll with it as well. Yeah. Who would win between Dom and Matty? <laughs> oh dear. Um, but again, like you said, the the support act um, thing, which we will talk about um, neck deep. Neck Deep aren't a small band. I feel like everyone at least knows the cover of Torn that they did. <laughs> Another controversial band. Really? Are they not like one of the bands with allegations against them? Oh. I don't have a clue. Possibly. They are they are in the pop punk. They're very punky. Um so it's a possibility, but I haven't heard anything myself. Well, I could have just pulled that out of nowhere then. I'm sure the guitarist 
I will have a quick Google. Maybe. We'll see. Um, but yeah, they're not a, a small band. I'm surprised actually that they opened for Youngblood because they do their own like headliner tours and they sell out pretty quick. Um, I know a lot of people that love them and would follow them to the ends of the earth. But they were really good. First time seeing them. Um, they call themselves generic pop punk, which I feel like is very true, but they are very good at the same time. Um, I always thought they were American just because of how the the singer sings, <laughs> but he's I not. They're actually from Wales, I think. American. Yeah, they sound so American, <laughs> but they're not. But no, it were it were a good night. Again, the crowd were rude, not great. I actually took my twelve year old uh, cousin with me, standing. <laughs> So that was fun. That were her first concert. That one, it were it were nice to see because I were twelve when we started going to shows, um, and it was sort of nice to be in the situation where I'm then letting her experience it. Um, but no, it were nice. It were nice. The crowd went mild. There were mosh pits, but they weren't great. Oh, that's disappointing. Yeah, very disappointing mosh pits, but. There we go. For a first concert for my cousin, she enjoyed it. So that's all that matters. It was good, but not great. Yeah. I have Googled it and it says their guitarist in 2015 got um, allegations of sending inappropriate photos to teenage girls. Ooh. But he's no longer in the band by the looks of it. Ah, uh, right, okay. So they did something about it, which is... Not what a lot of bands do. Yeah, more than most bands, yeah. Yeah. We have seen today Miss Scene Queen. Yes. She's released her 18 plus song, which is really good. Um, and men have reacted by admitting every man quotes is attracted to 16-year-old women yeah. and attacking her looks. Of course. Odd behaviour. Very odd. Not surprising, but still disappointing. Like, you don't have to like a song, but you just turn around and go, oh, it's not my cup of tea, that. Yeah, you, you know, don't have to attack don't... someone's physical looks just because Especially she's a woman. When... The point the of the song scene. is don't shag kids. Yeah, don't shag kids, guys. <laughs> um, well, you're a bit... Men. Oh, yeah. So we'll have a quick break for the Kathy show now, and then we'll be back and we'll talk about the concert experience. So buying tickets and etiquette. So, yeah, we'll be back. Yes. Hello and welcome to the Kathy Im Show. So following on on our topics for this podcast, where we're talking about music that means a lot to us and personal anthems and songs that have got us through significant moments in our life. Today, I have a lovely guest with me and her name is Lisa. Hi, Hi. Lisa. Hi, Kathy. Are you okay? How are you? I'm good, not bad this morning. How are you? Yes, I'm very excited to talk to you this morning because we had a little chat beforehand. Yeah. And um, I think you're quite an interesting character. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, city. yeah, character. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, Lisa, do you want to introduce yourself to our listeners? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm coming up to 43 years old. I'm originally from Yorkshire, from Huddersfield, but I spent a lot of the early noughties in London. Um, I did some modelling down there and I was in a terrible girl band. And um, that's where I had my, my first child and... It's where I did all my growing up, I think. <laughs> <laughs> was it? Yeah. Um, I lived in Labrick Grove. Yes. I also lived in Cricklewood. Yeah. Um, and I saw a lot, learned a lot. I grew up more in those three years. Yes. I think then. Sometimes more than what I wanted to. Yeah. But being down there in London at that time was 
amazing. Well for, said. Did you rub shoulders with any um, of the stars? Um, I would, yeah, uh, when I first moved there, I moved into Frog and Firkin in Leicester Square, and I was opposite um, the Odeon. And just around the corner, the Leicester Square, what was it back then? The other big theatre, so it was where all the premiers were. And I saw Tom Cruise's head and John <laughs> Shaboa's head out of my bedroom windows. There you go. But no, I did. I was lucky enough to meet. Um, I worked with Michael G. Wilson, producer of the James Bond films. I did Ooh. some live modelling for him um, during my pregnancy. And I had no idea who he was. Happened to laugh. So, yeah, that's a different story. Um I I met Paula Yates, who I believe you've been um, talking about. Yeah, um, yeah. Paula what? Yates was a really interesting character. That was through my daughter's father's family. Yeah. Um, and she was really lovely. Oh, lady. I love and she, that. I, I'm, I'm a similar age to yourself, and she was huge. Oh, yeah. Amazing. She was an icon. Absolutely. She was... She was we all wanted to be her, didn't yeah, we? Yeah, she, she, a lot of people will argue that she was that first girl who was famous for doing nothing, but she worked her ass off. She, she was a music journalist. She was, yeah, she, she worked and she got the stories that other people couldn't because the way yeah. that she was. Yeah. So, and yeah, she was, was submerged in that world. Absolutely, yeah. 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 So I was very lucky to, to have crossed paths with her and... Um, Damon Alban looked me up and down once at the corner shop after Ooh. I'd just had a baby. <laughs> hey, that's all right, isn't it? Hetty and Brown moving down the road from me on Oxford Gardens. And yeah. Mick Mayo used to live down the road. Oh, now he but is. He a was. Star. Oh, he, 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 he was drop dead Fred all the way from um, um, bottom and young ones and, and just yeah. everything yeah. from being a kid for me. Yeah. But I. He was the one person that I used to sort of go past his house and go, <laughs> 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 I think I'd do the same. <laughs> what would you say if you met him? You I can't be funny because you can't try and be funny. It's a Rick Mayle. No, so. no. you just yeah. have to be cute, wouldn't you? <laughs> but London at that time was, was amazing and I was lucky enough to go to like the super clubs, like home. Yeah. Huge, massive gay club, which everybody knows about. Yeah. And that was just like, that was... That was mind blowing. Yeah. Going to the Brixton Academy back in the day when it was still like the Brixton Academy and it wasn't all bought out. And yes. Then you yes. Shy. Before it was all commercialised. Yes. And 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 Labrat Grove itself with yeah. Carnival. Oh my God. My yeah. first Carnival. My first Carnival. I had cystitis. I had to wait in shop queue for four hours. <laughs> I can't believe to tell that. And all our listeners. <laughs> I know, yeah. Hi, so, at <laughs> least not my real name. <laughs> well, I think that's one of the best introductions we've had hey. on this podcast. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> so, Lisa, um, like I said, the topic of this podcast is, mm. um, you know, songs that have been with us during significant moments in yes. our lives. Um, is there a song that you have? Yes, Iris by the Goo Goo Dolls. Well, that's a very precious song <laughs> I know, to me. Yeah, we've just we've just because my so. daughter's called Iris. Yeah. yeah. Um, I first when the film first came out, City of Angels was yes. the first time I'd heard the track, and I was at Scarborough Uni, and I'd not yet gone to London. I wasn't in the big bright lights and everything. It was just a really personal song to me. I always loved it. And um, I, I've suffered with endometriosis since I was 17. I was always told I'd never be able to carry a child, I'd never mind give birth. Yeah. Um, and in London, I got pregnant with Chloe Jane. Oh. And um, I unfortunately couldn't have the water birth, the whole, you know, incense going experience that I wanted. I was going to have a cesarean, that's why it was. So, so is it an emergency caesarean? Um, she ended up being an emergency caesarean, but um, I've got a man's pelvis. Right. So she was always going to be a caesarean. So um, I, the one the one song that I had, and I actually had the the sort of the, the hit song, the chart release. Yeah. And I had the instrumental score as well of the City of Angels. Yeah. And, and that was on my CD. So and you had a birthing CD absolutely, that you Absolutely, and that was my... And she was emergency caesarean. I had to go by ambulance, so <laughs> I didn't have the bag and this, that, and the other, and and I didn't have my songs. So as far as I was con- concerned, everything sort of, you know, I was, I was scared. I was young. Yeah. I was only twenty two. I didn't oh, have my mum or my family were back home, and um, 
uh, dad was trying to make his way and the second that the surgeon started on the radio, just random London radio station, the Goo Goo Dolls, Iris, played that second. Oh my God, so and it's I started always crying, meant to be. And my midwife was like, oh. you okay? And I told her, she was like, ooh. <laughs> and, I know you, and I have just said, I haven't met one person who hasn't got a meaningful story about that song. It is a very interesting song like that, isn't it? There must it? be something... It does mean a lot to a lot of people. should play it backwards and see what it says. <laughs> I can imagine it's got an angelic message because it is quite an angelic song. Every, everyone I know who goes, oh, yeah, that song, everyone's yeah. got a story. Yeah, yeah. well, everyone. I told you about my um, my story with it because mm-hmm. I, I had a miscarriage and mm-hmm. the name I've always had is Iris. Yeah. For, for um, you know... For a baby, that's you know, I always knew I was going to call my daughter Iris. That was a book that I read when I was in school when I was about seven or eight, and the character okay. was called Iris. So, obviously, when that song came out, and then I had a miscarriage when I walked in mm-hmm. um, from being in hospital, I just put on the TV, which was tuned already into the music channel, and instantly that song started playing with the video. See? And I knew that everything would be all right. Be and I would and have now a baby. You've got your Iris. Yeah, six years after. And do you know Iris means rainbow? Does it? In Greek mythology. Oh, so wow. Iris is my actual rainbow baby. Six oh, years wow. later, she was born. <laughs> oh, so there you go. See, there you go. I, I wonder, I'd love you to do a little mini survey. How many people? Yes. With that song? Yeah. I bet you don't find men that go, no. yes, yeah, all right. People never say, yeah, it's all right. They have to go, I've not heard it. I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, oh, you'll never guess what happened to me with that song. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So is there any other songs Um, that are like personal anthems that have got you through significant um, um, or challenging times in your life? There's, uh, I've moved away from London a long time ago, but that was somewhere where I first really addressed my own mental health problems. I was on my own and I, I was... I was free to 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 go to what counsellors were best for me. I was working. I was on good money. I was modelling. I went to. Oh, I've done therapy. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Yeah, lots of. But um, so it was a tough time. But again, I did a hell of a lot of growing up, and then I've come across um, and I, it's called Georgiou Music. Yes. Um, I'm sure it's a better, more Greek way of pronouncing that, but he's a young artist and he's British and he he's wrote a song called That's Her. Yeah. And it's been used in a lot of talky ticky ticky tocky videos oh, yes, and things yes. like that. And I was like, that's cool. And when you read the lyrics to it, just the poetry of his writing, yeah. I'm a huge literature fan, he's, he's got it. And he's able to swap between his own story of being a young dad right. dealing with depression. And I think, I think he might be bipolar. I'm not sure. Sorry if I'm wrong. And then tell it from a lot of different perspectives. Okay. And I wish I'd have had that song back, back then because it's one of them that goes. There's loads of us. Yeah. yeah. So if I could have so told my younger relate. self in London. Yeah. It's all right, because by the time you get to 43, all your mates have got the same weird stories. (laughs) We're all mad here. Yeah. (laughs) So, yeah, those are my two tracks that, um, for me, at the moment, are big ones. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you for sharing them with us, Thank you for letting me. It's been lovely talking to you. And I'm going (sighs) to check out that song. So what's he called? Uh, George U Music. And he's on Facebook and everything. I'll send you a YouTube. Oh, right. Thank you. Today, I have a very interesting, lovely guest. Um, I've got Caitlin with me. Hi, Caitlin. Hi, Gary. How are you? Oh, well... (laughs) I was sleeping this morning. Absolutely fine. <laughs> you, you, you forgot to put your alarm on. I forgot to put the alarm on, yes. Oh, well, it happens. One happens. of those mornings. Yeah, it happens to us all, don't worry. Yeah. We're fine. We've got a cup of tea now, haven't we? Oh, yes. <laughs> so, um, Caitlin, would you like to introduce yourself to our listeners? Well, um, I'm 52. i lived in Mosley, apparently, for just over the last 10 years. Wow. Uh, yeah. Um, it's... Uh, Six years in the current flat and just over, well, it's, yeah, actually, no, it's not quite ten years, and three and a bit years in the previous flats, um, elsewhere in Mosley. Um, yeah, 
uh, transgender currently um, on hormone treatment, so hopefully it won't be too long before I have the surgery. Yeah. Um, 17 years ago yesterday, I did my first live radio show. Because that's what you do, don't you? That's you're, what I do. You're, that's a, what you're I do. a radio yes, presenter. A radio, radio presenter. Yeah. Um, uh, fully voluntary. It's been it's been the case since then. Um, I like it. I like it being voluntary because then I have the flexibility to say, well, if I'm if I'm really not up to it that day, I'm like, no, I'm not doing it. Um, but yeah, uh, 17, 17 years of it. And how things have changed. We started off in a in a room. Um, was it, well, it's probably actually a little bit smaller than my bedroom, with about twenty thousand pounds worth of equipment in it. Yeah. And as it was last week, um, I did a show where literally I was using a an ancient laptop. <laughs> And an Xbox headset, and that's the entire show off that. As long as I've got an internet connection, I'm fine. Well, once you um, actually DJ'd, um, did a live radio show from my kitchen, didn't we? I yeah. did, yes. It yeah. just goes to demonstrate. Yeah. I, I was, I was. We the, were listening in the garden, I having a bonfire. I was the background to your uh, background music to your party. Yes, you were. It was a really, really good night. That very flexible. So the topic of um, this month's um, podcast. Yeah is songs that are personal anthems yes i was wondering caitlin can you tell us any songs um that have like that personal meaning to you uh yes i have i have picked three in particular um in no particular order okay uh we'll start off with well, actually no we'll start off with what's probably been the longest one that i can remember um, Irene Cara, Flashdance. Oh wow, what a song! We yeah. lost, we lost Irene Cara, didn't we? Like we, a few months ago. We did. Did we? Yeah, oh, yeah. She passed away. Oh, yeah. No. Oh god. Yeah, I'm she, sorry she, to she give has... you the sad news, but oh well. You know, yeah. Can't can't win them all. The epitome of the eighties, isn't it? Really, uh, that yeah, song. that that one definitely was. Yeah. Um, yeah. Literally, like I mean, I've. Oh, I did seven and a half years of dance classes as well. Oh, did you? Were well, you very musical? In my twenties, yeah. Um, I was I was actually quite fit back then. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, with that one, you know, you bring anything that sort of says music or dance, and it, you know, it is a feeling. It is, yeah. And you know it, it brings absolutely anybody to life. Yeah, with, it's a very with, joyful song, yeah, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, the the right music will bring anybody happiness. Yeah, yeah, and definitely. That has been one of my go-to songs for about as long as I can remember. Yeah, yeah, a very positive song. Yes, and you can have a bit of a dance to it. <laughs> uh, you can, yes. So you can do what I do to it murder it badly by trying to sing <laughs> what on karaoke <laughs> do you know that's what i've never done on karaoke yet that one. i have i have yeah. yeah when i was a bit younger it was my go-to karaoke song nice. <laughs> but it's got a high note in it uh, yes <laughs> and that's the tough bit <laughs> no hang on i can hit them high notes you know that <laughs> yes <laughs> and what that's other it. songs have you got um second one that's come to mind um patrick hernandez born to be alive oh wow now we're talking now uh, yes. that is a disco classic i think i once requested you to play that one yes at, uh, one particular disco actually um because it literally is you know life is for living it is it is you are yeah. born you are literally born to be alive yeah and the aim is there to um, make what you can out of life and make it the best that you can. What wise words, that's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And again, it's a good dancing song. It, oh, yeah, yes. it puts it, you it, in a good it mood. It is one of them, you know, puts you in a good mood. It's, it's a go-to song for when I'm in the shower because I've actually got the, um, the extended seven minute version of it. Yeah. And um, I can literally put that on, jump in the shower, and 
I know that if it's if it finishes before I get out, I've been in too long. <laughs> <laughs> so it's good. It's a good song to time your shower to. Yeah, yeah, basically. <laughs> Uh, not not necessarily a good one to sing in the shower, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> and what is your third choice? Oh well, my third one is a little bit more up to date. Alicia Keys, "Girl on Fire." Oh wow! Yes, right. yes, that's an empowering song. That uh, yes, it is because literally um, since transitioning, this girl has been on fire. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and I think that one sort of came out about the same time as well. Actually. I can't exactly when I came out but um, it's just one that sort of I uh, gained um, affinity with me so to speak yeah. so it um, really resonates with you yeah and it does represent um, both sides of life as well because you know as you know watch her she brightens up the night nobody knows that she's a lonely girl yeah it's a lonely world yeah and yes, you know, there has there has been those times where it literally felt like it's just been me against the world. Yeah. Yeah, but, so that um, sort of particular song it, it yeah. speaks to you with your challenges that you've had to exactly. overcome. Yeah. 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 But you know, I've been up there. You are. I don't know, I don't know. Yeah, you are. You shine, <laughs> Caitlin, you really do. I do my best. <laughs> Well, thank you for talking to us today and sharing them You're welcome. wonderful songs with yeah. us. So yeah. we're, we're probably going to go and have a listen to them now. Uh, and yes. do, a, do a bit of disco dancing and yeah. maybe karaoke. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I need some karaoke practice, actually. Um, I'm due to sing in front of my biggest audience for well, 19 years nearly. Ah, yeah. In April. Yeah. In April. So what's happening there? Well, it's the Roller Coaster Club of Great Britain's Black Bull Bash. Oh, yeah. It's one of our big events. And we have this um, bit where uh, members get up and they do their own talent. We call it the gong show. <laughs> the aim is actually to be the worst. That's how you win. Oh, I um, should be all right then. <laughs> I'm not. Oh, no. There's, there's, that, trust me, there's far worse than you out there. I've seen most of them. <laughs> And um, I'm I'm singing there. So have you picked your song? I have actually, and again, uh, this is this is one that's actually it it resonated with me very recently after somebody literally did try to tear me down. Yeah. So I picked um, Sam Bailey skyscraper. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. So you can see why some, yes. you know, somebody tried to tear me down, but I come back. Yes. Rising from the ground like a skyscraper. Oh, well, you enjoy singing that, Caitlin. Oh, yes. I'm going <laughs> to love it. You take care. Thank you for joining You're us welcome. today. Thank you. See you soon. See you soon. Hello again, and this is Kathy Yim. Welcome to my show. Now, with me today, I've got Zay. Hello. <laughs> Hello, Zay. How are you? Doing pretty good, yeah. How about you? Yeah, I'm okay. Busy day. Yeah. We like it busy, don't we? We just had a little chat beforehand. Mm -hmm. um, I would like um, if you could introduce yourself to our audience listening today. Yeah, sure. Well, um, I'm Zay Alabi. I'm, I'm 20. I'm a musician, um, writer. Um, I, I draw a bit as well. I'm involved with the Creative Writing Society, so I help organise a lot of events relating to that. I'm working on a novel. I run around, <laughs> essentially. I do a lot of things. Wow, <laughs> that is a lot. So you are a true creative then, aren't you? Yeah, I've been doing it since I was very, very young. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so when, when did you start like picking up like, play music? Um, I was given a really old acoustic guitar in my first primary school, and I offered to give it back, and the school was like, no, you can just keep it. And so I just had this free... Not very good, but a free um, guitar that I had. So I just started playing with that. And then the exact same thing happened in GCSEs, but someone gave me an electric guitar instead. So I've <laughs> just always been had, I've been given the ability to play music since yeah. I was like a kid. So I've just been doing it constantly. And you got that upgrade <laughs> when you got to your GCSEs. Yeah, exactly. It was nice. It was very nice. So the um, Creative Writing Society, that, mm -hmm. that's that's interesting. Yeah. Where it, where, that's based in Huddersfield. Yes, yes it is. Yeah, can you tell me a bit about that? Sure. Um, well, I wasn't always the um, vice president. The year that I became the vice president was the second year of the society running. Yeah. So the first year I just showed up, read out some poetry and 
Um, they immediately knew that I had some pretty good talent when it came to writing and understanding story structure and all that sort of stuff. And so by the time elections rolled around, they yeah. offered me the position and I agreed. And so I help to um, run some of the open mic nights that they do. I run a weekly um, creative writing sort of events over in a local um, arcade shop. It's a very nice place just for just to give writers a very regular space to do writing because as much as rewriters love to write yeah it's also the bane of our existence to oh, write no. yeah <laughs> so it's important to get and um, give people that structure so they can show up and be around some fellow writers to continue the the work basically. oh that's fantastic so yeah. it's really good support then as well like you're a good support <laughs> network for each other yeah exactly yeah oh wow <laughs> amazing so um what i'm interested in we're with this podcast and this podcast, um, these podca- podcast interviews mm-hmm. is, um, you know, songs that are personal to us. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of people have songs that are personal anthems, if you like. Mm. Do you have any songs that mean something to you that have been with you in your life? Yeah, sure. Um, there are two main songs really that come to mind. There's a song called Redbone by Childish Gambino, which blew up. I think sometime in 2016 due to TikTok do it, yeah. doing its thing. Yeah. And it's a very slow, jazzy, blues, soulful song. Yeah. And I remember the first time I heard it, it was with earpieces and it just like completely grabbed my attention from like that very first time. And oh. I like singing it because he sings in a very like falsetto-y tone. And yeah. it's just, it's just a beautiful song, like a very, very gorgeous one. And what is it that um, it grabs you? Is it something about the lyrics or um, just the, the melody itself? It's hard to describe because I feel like the lyrics of a song are very important, but the mood and feel of the song is so just as important. The ambience of the, yeah, the song itself. It, exactly. It's how it feels, the sort of mood that it, it conveys. It's a very, like, what would be a good way of putting it? Imagine your um driving around at 12 a.m in a city that's like the sort of energy that the the song has or like dancing in in a nightclub or something it's a very very interesting um feel but it's good it's it's, it's a great i'm gonna take a listen yeah Yeah. it's good yeah and what is the other song then the second one is an entirely different um energy there's a i guess technically he's a rapper though he likes mixing a lot of genres together his name is lil darky and okay, um, yeah. he has a song called rap music like the name is just rap music mm-hmm. and it's a very aggressive like he's like they're screaming and like very aggressive guitar and it's a song that you can really dance to and it's a very <laughs> it's exact entirely different from the first song but it's very very <laughs> energetic yeah and it's, it's it's just a very very good song and when do you put that song on what mood are you in what you know um, what are you usually doing <laughs> if it's like I always request it if I go to a club, like yeah. for someone to play, yeah. because I, I love dancing and dancing to that song is a very good energy. If I yeah. want to play some really aggressive guitar, I can put on that song to get myself in like the headspace for it. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's just, it's fantastic. So it's, it's almost like um, it's your motivation song. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, brilliant. Fantastic. <laughs> so um, would you say that there's a song that influenced you as a musician? As a musician, um, when I was younger, the way that I really interacted with music was via SoundCloud. Yeah. And not SoundCloud rappers, because that's like the thing that a lot of people think about when it comes to SoundCloud. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of lo-fi artists and people creating remixes and instrumentals and that like people have no idea about because it's very underground. Yeah. So I'd listen to that stuff. And there was a lot of music that was related to like people sampling Japanese vocalists. It's a very, very niche oh, thing. Oh, wow. That's yeah. very interesting. And so I would listen to these um, songs. I'd have no idea what the vocalists were singing about, but they were so, they were so beautiful. They were very, very, like, um, operatic and very, mm-hmm. very, like, ethereal. And in more recent times, I've been slowly figuring out where those samples come from. Like, I'll accidentally find it. And I'll go, yeah. oh, my God, this is... I listened to this, like, five years ago. And so that's, like, been the, the major... The biggest influence when it comes to creating my music, having that sort of operatic, ethereal sound yeah. to, to things because of those very old samples a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing the use of sampling, isn't it? I, it's, you know, it's I wonderful. find it, like, um, you know, a creative... Um, 
art form in itself. It really yeah, is. <laughs> I do. I love it personally myself. <laughs> So thank you for talking to me today, Zay. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, you know, you're such an interesting character. <laughs> well, thank and you. And what an eclectic mix of music that you like as well. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to check out a couple of them songs that you yeah. mentioned. Of course. Um, see you soon. Yes, I'll, I'll see you soon. Yeah, lovely to meet you. <laughs> lovely Bye. to meet you too. Bye. <laughs> So um, now we're back. Thank you, Kathy. Woo, woo. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's. I feel like this episode's going to be a little bit less structured than last episode. Um, just talking about opinions, our experiences of sort of the before content process, um, buying tickets, um, the issues that come about that the big companies who shall not be named very vague <laughs> we're, we're too poor for a, a lawsuit at the minute yes no thank you we're only in episode two we don't make that much money <laughs> um touting is a big one as well i don't know what that means so um again let me just google The official definition is... What is the full meaning of counting? Here we go. Um, apparently it says to advertise, talk about, or praise something or someone repeatedly, especially as a way of encouraging people to like, accept, or buy something. But my understanding was touting was big companies buying tickets in bulk right to then sell for more money than the face value was my understanding of it could be wrong well by the official definition technically every site is in it yeah yeah technically because you see they would be like oh i love this band this band's great live buy the tickets yeah you see a lot of advertising like that so i feel like by the official definition there's a very fine line between advertising tickets to to sell and actually touting them but like i said from my understanding it could be very very wrong but it was sort of companies buying them in bulk or even individual people i've seen do it not so much now that there's been like a a crackdown on it um but just buying them in bulk to then sell them off for more especially tickets that sell out really really quick yeah i think that's what the um site was that the hello megatar tickets are from mm, yeah the big v <laughs> yeah yeah i mean i feel like it is an issue but I feel like it also doesn't happen as much anymore. Like, I found whenever I Google concept tickets, that particular site will come up um, as, like, the first one. I don't know if that's because the, the company pay for it to be the first, because I know you can do that, but yeah. that always comes up. I think we've recently bought something from that site. I think mm-hmm. that's where Matt and his brother got... Um one of their Paris tickets from at least. Uh, I know one of them was definitely a, a site just for reselling. I can't remember if the other was like reselling from Ticketmaster or yeah. from another site. Yeah. Very strange. But um, the first thing on my list is just ticket buying and issues. So um, pricing with the added fees from big companies is a big thing that I've found um again not naming and shaming but the big companies that are trusted and you know people buy from quite a lot you'll find that for example the face value of a ticket will be like 30 pounds and then by the time that you pay for protection if you do pay for protection um shipping because a lot of them i've um especially young blood i found some of them will be online so you have the app and then you scan it when you get there. But the Youngblood one had no option for the online ones. You had to pay extra for it to be shipped, which I've not seen before, but I found and I thought that were a little bit dodgy. Surely yeah. it's more effort to print the tickets and then send them out than it is 
to send a barcode to your phone. But anyway, um, and then obviously the handling fees, whatever admin fees. I get that the the actual venue has to make money Mm -hmm. and the people that are selling the tickets have to make money. But when you calculate all, it's a lot of money to buy for tickets that actually when you break it down, the artist doesn't get the entire amount or a fair share. Obviously, the bigger the band, the less they're going to care about it. When you're paying, what, between hundred and uh, between 80 and £100 pounds for a ticket, they're still going to get a fair cut. But when you're thinking smaller bands that are selling out bigger venues, they're not getting a lot. And they actually take a percentage of merch sales as well. Yeah. Which, when you factor in the sort of confectionery that they sell, the drinks, the food, um, obviously they've got to make some money, but I feel like it's becoming a little bit ridiculous, the fees that they're adding on. It is, because, like, venues won't just get money from tickets. You know, there's from the bar and merch tables now. Yeah, exactly. It's <laughs> sorry. It it's quiet really now, quiet, like... so I'm having to hold it up to my ear and then pause. <laughs> right. Um. But yeah, they do. It's a capitalist thing. Of course, they've got to make money because if they didn't make money as a venue, then they wouldn't be, you know, hosting events. If they didn't make money as a ticket selling company, then they wouldn't sell tickets. But I feel like when you actually break it down and how much you're paying for the fees versus how much you're paying for the ticket versus how much the artist actually gets a cut of that, it's not all about money. Most artists will play for playing sake because it's enjoyable. I'd love to do it if if I had an ounce of effort in me. (laughs) But (laughs) it's expensive to be a band. It's expensive to, to go touring. There's a lot of expenses in it and they've got to also make money to live off and I feel like they're not getting a fair cut. And then obviously we're paying ridiculous prices for... When it, um, Robert Smith from The Cure... Yeah. Yeah, that was, that, that was offering like half refunds for tickets. He's a good egg. Yeah, very. Uh, I did find... I can't find any of the notes that I've prepared for this <laughs> session at all, so I am kind of going off top of my head. Um, but I did find an article about some Taylor Swift fans that are suing Ticketmaster mm. over these extra costs. Yeah. The gist of it was the ticket cost, I think, like $50, and then with all the added fees, $200 each, Ugh. which is crazy it is it's ridiculous Um, i did some more googling into that and they have stopped it like the the i think the phrase is wavered their right to sue yeah 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 so don't know what's happened between now and then but that was that could have been really helpful for those that are poor and wanting to go to gigs and Yeah, that's the thing, like, yes, seeing concerts is a luxury, and especially in this economy, it's Mm. not feasible for everyone, but why should we not be able to go and see a band that we've loved and listened to and supported for so many years? You know, it's it's sad. Um, But, yeah, also on the note of buying, especially online, um, I don't know how many people actually buy from the box office. I don't know if that's still a thing. Um, But online queuing systems is, I feel like it should be better managed. Like, obviously your bigger bands are going to sell out, but the queuing systems, I feel like they don't work as well as they should. I've been lucky that most tickets that I've gone to buy, I have bought, but you've got to be quick. You've got to be on the website hours before the sale starts to actually have a chance of getting them. Um, Again, tying into pre-sale codes I tried getting uh, some tickets for the intimate show that Fallout Boy did um, I think it was like last week week before 
you could only get the tickets if you've got a pre-sale code and I was like eh, I'll try because you know I like them I've seen them before it's an intimate show who wouldn't want to go to an intimate show possibly meet them um the pre-sale link didn't work um there was an issue I think they'd said that they were going to sell the tickets on one day and then when you went to follow the link it was like oh no actually we've moved it to tomorrow um probably to give people more time to get the codes because it was very rushed and then on the day again the link didn't work and then when it did work the tickets had sold within it was like one minute past nine I think it was that it was sold out so within minutes and I actually had to check Twitter because I was like is this real do I need to keep like on the site to get the tickets because it's saying that there's like error but no it really genuinely sold out quick and I feel like it should be a better system I don't know I've not got any suggestions so I don't know if if there's anyone who feels the same that feels you know opinionated or has any suggestions on the better way to do it but I just feel like the queue kicks you out very easy um I feel like some queues you don't get a number so I found sometimes it'll be like, oh, there's so many people ahead of you and it'll count down. But then other times on the same website, it'll just be like, oh, keep refreshing the page. So you don't actually know where you are. So to me, refreshing the page loses your place and you're less likely to get the ticket. Um, I just feel like it's not managed very well and technology doesn't work well under pressure. And sites crash all the time. And unless they've got like a full team expecting it to crash it doesn't get resolved quickly enough and then by the time it is resolved the tickets are are gone and it's very difficult to get tickets yeah this was also in the um article um the article is called Ticketmaster has taken all the fun out of concerts something like that and i don't remember who it's by yeah um but that mentioned how like Every time you wake up, you queue, you queue, you queue, and then it crashes. And surely by now, if you expect all these people to come at once, you'd be able to work out a way for the site to handle that flow of people. Exactly. And it's not as if it's a new thing. This has been going on for years and years. I mean, since probably online ticket selling was a thing, it's been difficult and I understand it's also difficult like I said I don't have any ideas of how it could be better managed I'm not some sort of tech genius I don't I don't know how it fully works but you'd think by now knowing how quickly it sells out and of course not everyone's going to get tickets there's going to be more people wanting tickets than there is tickets to sell but again you'd feel like that there's a better system to be able to get them rather than queuing refreshing queuing refreshing oh it's crashed I've got to go on a different browser oh the tickets are sold out it just doesn't make sense yeah I mean I remember back in like 2010 me being like in front of Ticketmaster waiting for my parents my mum's on phone to box office my grandma in Sheffield's on phone to box office trying to get tickets to McFly yeah Menace. and it's still the same now it, it really is and like I said I feel like there will always be that sort of overflow of people. Obviously, tickets are going to sell out. Obviously, people are going to be disappointed. But it's just not a well-managed system for something that's so popular. And no. it's just, I don't know. If anyone has suggestions, feel free. Instagram page. Um, we've got Twitter as well. Um, we've got an email address that's linked on those. Um, we could probably go through it next time any suggestions but it's just it's a weird system um same with resale I feel like I do like the resale because Mm. when I used to gig if you couldn't go to a gig you'd just give your ticket to a friend or you'd sell it online Mm. or someone would pick it up or whatever but obviously they're trying to stop ticket touting and stuff like that and I feel like there was a period when they cracked down on it that there was a big scare that you have to bring your IDs to concerts and I still get terrified now because the name that I buy the tickets in is my old surname 
and my new surname is what's on my ID. So I still get terrified that they're going to turn around and say no because it's not the same name. I don't know why they brought that in. Um, especially of the fact that you can buy resale tickets that are in someone else's name. Um, I do think it is a good idea. But then again, I found um, with the tickets that I sold in December for Pierce Vale, I bought them for more than I could sell them for because you've got to sell them at face value of the ticket minus the fees. So I took a loss um, because obviously you pay the fees as well as the face value. But then I think it was, I think it came to about £60 a ticket, but I could only sell them for about 45 which was the face value of the ticket, which seems a little bit silly. Well, they've got their money now, why should they care? Yeah, exactly. I mean... I don't know if it would have made a difference paying for ticket protection, but then again, that's an added, what, two to four pound per ticket Yeah. that you're sort of losing out on. Um, over, overall, I do think resale's good because circumstances change, things happen, um, anything could happen. So it's good, but also, again, they're very greedy in that they don't actually give you the money that you paid for the tickets. Yeah. Um, let's have a look. I feel like the next couple of issues, apart from one, um, are to do with the actual tour managing the side and the management side rather than the tickets and buying them. Um, right. I feel like accessibility is one that I, I would like to mention, but I don't know a lot about. Um, from the shows that I've been to recently, especially, I've not seen a lot of accessible areas. Um, I've been to one before where they've got like big disabled signs and it'll be sort of like a barriered off area close to the stage where you can still get close but you're in a safer area so you're not getting pushed about designated spot but the last couple that I've been to I've not actually seen anything obvious that doesn't mean it's not there because I am oblivious usually in my own world but I'd sort of like to mention it because I don't know if it is a problem and being able-bodied I wouldn't want to miss that out um so again if there's anyone that is sort of disabled do get accessible tickets anything like that um sort of feel free to to write to us messages uh, with your opinions if there's any issues Again, like I said, something I'd like to mention because I feel like it's not talked no, about had a lot. Then, um, both concerts I went to this month were in venues where you had to go like downstairs, like basement venues. Mm. And obviously, if you have disability, maybe there's a, a lift or something that's a bit out of sight which it shouldn't be, mm. you know. But I've only ever seen ramps and things at, like, big arenas. Yeah. But even so, like, when I've bought tickets, there'll be no option on the actual ticket list, the, like, the, mm. the drop box for accessible tickets. You've got to buy the tickets and then call them to request accessibility, which yeah. I feel like it puts you on the spot because... You could be disabled for any amount of reason. You could have, like, mental health issues that means you don't want to ring or can't ring. You might not physically be able to call them if you're, like, hearing impaired or visually impaired. And I feel like there should be more... Accessibility should be more accessible. Yeah, definitely. It's, like, an extra task that shouldn't be an extra task. Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, if anyone has anything to add or anything to, to discuss about that, that probably would be an interesting one because um, I don't see a lot of people talking about it. I've looked on Twitter as well and you don't really see a lot. Um, so I don't know if it's just not utilised, if it's not there at all or if it is and it's just not as obvious. Um, but yeah, I feel like that would be an interesting post. talk. Um, but yeah, the the next couple I have are more about management. Um so we've spoken about the Harry Styles times, the the opening door times compared to the start times of the band. So 
I understand that they've got to allow a certain amount of time for like queuing, actually getting in and settled in the venue. And then obviously people might need to go to the toilet, might need drinks, stuff like that. But I feel like you're still waiting a very long time. Like, I feel like we waited about an hour and 45 minutes at Youngblood for him to start. And we weren't there particularly early because I, um, I don't think me and my partner Harry, we couldn't get the day off work. So we finished at five and the doors were at six and we were still waiting when we got there. Wow. Um, so I feel like that is more, maybe more arena management. I don't know if that's them or if it's like the bands and the bands management that sorts that um but I feel like you should be more mindful that people will be waiting a long time and then you've got to think they've got to go they've got to stand or if you're seated you've got to sit through all the support acts and then the actual band and then by the end of it you're absolutely knackered yeah (laughs) obviously it's different for other people people have better tolerances I'm an old lady at heart I'm usually in bed by half past nine oh hell yeah So, obviously, on a concert day, when it's a late finish and you've been stood up between four and eight hours, it's a long time. Um, But, no, that is something that I've found with the concert times versus start times. It's weird. I don't mind the ones that are, like, doors at seven, first bands on half seven. Yeah, stuff like that. Like, I feel like half an hour, 45 minutes away is a good time. When, When it's, like... I think five sauce because they were the only ones on yeah that was like an hour over an hour's wait yeah I don't know I feel like I feel like there's method to the madness with them that they have got to allow time for people to get in especially bigger concerts where people might be queuing up for hours before to get there early people might push to get to front depending on what yeah. show it is um, but I feel like some venues over um, overdo it with the, the wait times. Harry Styles definitely did. Harry Styles was really bad. What was it, three, four hours? Yeah, I sort of get it because the, they didn't have any capacity for like queuing and stuff like that before. Mm. But the queues weren't that bad. And once you were in, because the the entire sort of standing area was sectioned anyway, Yeah. it didn't need to be that long of a wait. No. Um, and then the last thing that I've got is issues with location. Um, I found this today. I was talking to one at Lasses at work about Busted. Right. I feel like a lot of bands aren't very close to us. And I feel like this is me just complaining. <laughs> I feel like sometimes the closest that we get bands is Manchester. Which, that's like the big one there's we get Leeds and Sheffield as yeah well. that's what I was gonna say like we've world. got two really good venues in we've got the Leeds one we've got the Chef there's there's actually there's a couple of venues in Leeds and Chef that are really good um yeah. but I feel like a lot of bands sort of don't go Leeds and Sheffield that they'll just go Manchester and I don't it's know a bit, why, because Leeds is better than Manchester yeah it's a bit disappointing because like up the north you know <laughs> yeah they always say like i don't know they'll probably say this at every gig but they're like oh the north's the best crowd but come i feel like the, more, then. yeah exactly come to <laughs> us more um obviously i think busted are coming to leeds but i don't know i just feel like i've found that especially a lot of big bands they'll do like uk tour and it'll be like four dates in london one in Wales, one in Scotland, one in Ireland, Manchester, and you're like, ah! I don't even think they bother with Wales, to be fair. No, not often. No. Very strange. But yeah, I feel like that is more down to tour management um, than it is. And obviously there's going to be issues with availability and stuff like that, but come to the north, we're really good people. We are. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think... Overall, there's a lot of flaws and faults within the before concert process um, that can easily be solved and sort of need more backing from concert goers because I feel like we don't talk about stuff enough. What do you mean? Um, I don't know. I just feel like you don't see a lot about 
the the ticket buying process, the online queuing, the the pricing. I know you said you've seen a couple of articles, but actually I've not really seen a lot. I don't know if it's a personal thing, um, but I feel like I don't see a lot of people talk about the issues within the before concert. Yeah, we will probably talk about this a, a bit more. I was going to say, um, when you're on about accessibility. I have seen a Facebook post before that was saying like why a disabled entrance is like wheelchair entrance is usually like some sketchy side door. Yeah. That's not really fair. And it's not and it shouldn't be something discussed. I'm trying to be careful with my words here. Yeah. I things should just be accessible without it being something else does that make sense yeah like it should be accessible for accessibility rather than oh we have to legally have an accessible point oh we've got this door meh it's accessible yeah not just uh oh you have to let us know we have to make this accessible for you just is this accessible for everyone yes good yeah you don't need to disclose anything just show up yeah being accessible not just in case but because it's you know there's a lot of people that aren't able-bodied and not all disabilities are visible um there needs to be like optional seating as well even if it's like pull down seats at a wall yeah because again someone may be more abled and like, say you've got arthritis, you won't then disclose it as a disability. Mm. But by the end of a show, you could be in pain. Mm. Yeah. You'd need somewhere to sit. Yeah, exactly. I feel like it's accessible for people that have, like, wheelchairs and crutches. And I feel like it's very dismissed, the fact that I don't, it's it's very difficult to word. Um but like quote unquote visible big disabilities yeah yes will be accessible for them but stuff like muscular problems skeletal problems that might not always be a problem people who can walk but may need to use aid sometimes yeah um it's not very accessible for them um yeah, I agree with your optional seating's a good a good show. I've seen it sometimes, but not always. Yeah, and if it is, there's not a lot of it. Mm, yeah. Yeah, it it needs to be addressed. Yeah, absolutely. And shall we very quickly go on to concert etiquette? Go on to. Oh, concert etiquette. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> I worked quick enough with my ear. <laughs> um. Yeah. So. I feel like growing up, going to concerts, it's a big, scary experience. You're very young. Um, a lot of people are older than you. But I feel like I quickly found, especially going to smaller concerts before going to bigger concerts, that yeah. it's sort of a community and everyone looks out for everyone. And even if you don't know that person, if you get knocked down, you get picked up. Yeah. And I found, especially in the alternative sort of heavier scene, not to tar everyone with the same brush because and not everyone might have this experience, but I found people tend to be nicer and more considerate. Um, mm. Just in my experience, anyway. I don't not that I've been yeah. to many pop gigs to sort of um, compare it to, and again, not tarring everyone. Um, obviously, not everyone's going to have the same experience, but you sort of get that community feeling, and everyone's there for the same reason, and it's such a good atmosphere. But then, like I said earlier, recently, um, I don't know if it's just, it's to, to word it very unpolitely, I don't know if it's just the new generation of gig goers, but I feel like there's no etiquette. And concert etiquette is sort of um, an unofficial thing anyway, but I just feel like people aren't as polite anymore. People will push you to get to the front. People aren't as nice. Yes. They will scream in your ear and it's just not and it ruins the night as well like you go and then 
something happens and it puts you off and then you're you're constantly looking for people badging into you and you're not watching a concert and it really does put you off and it really does ruin what should be a really good and sort of unionized experience everyone's going for the same reason everyone likes the same music at at the concert so I don't understand why it's as sort of brutal and as intense as it is yeah it um it is a newer thing and I do think it's just after covid people could probably just have the mindset of I've been locked up for a few years. I don't care about you. I'm having my fun. And I've addressed this in my Sleeping with Sirens review. Mm. The crowd can make and break a concert for someone. Mm. So it's all well and good you having a good time. But if you having a good time injures someone, scares them, triggers them, that's... You're, you're a bit of an asshole for it yeah absolutely it's just it's not the same as it used to be and I think like you said Covid is a really really good example of it we see it in veterinary we see it in shops retail um, online people just don't care as much as they did anymore and I feel like Covid should have had the opposite effect and made people miss that sense of group that sense of union and just being nice to people obviously people that eh, snowflakes everyone gets triggered by everything it's not even that it's just decent human interaction like being a yeah. decent human costs nothing being polite costs nothing do you know what I mean like people don't even when they're pushing past you people don't even go oh my friend's at the front anymore they don't do that they just push past and it's not a nice push it's not a bobbing and weaving within crowds they will push you down to get to the front yeah. And it's just not nice anymore. And I feel like it will put people off gigs. I mean, I've said to my partner before, if, you know, we'll probably go see 1975 again, but I feel like if the crowd continues to stay as it was, I'm not going to waste money on tickets that I know is going to be ruined for me because it's not worth it. Yeah, like, just get seated if that's the option. Yeah, exactly. And, again, seated, people might not have the same opinion, but seated versus standing is a completely different kettle of fish. Like, yeah. I've seen Green Day seated, and it was still an amazing gig. I still had such a good time. But then I've seen them standing, and it's a completely different show. The atmosphere is different. Not everyone has the capability to stand. Not everyone has the capability to see, you know, some tickets might be cheaper than others, people might prefer seated, but it is different, the atmosphere different, but I feel like you're more likely to get your time ruined by standing and having a really bad crowd than you are from seated, and I feel like more people will go seated. But then seated, you get, obviously everyone stands up still for the show, Yeah. but then you get like the odd person that sits down through the show and they're like, oh don't stand up, I can't see. Yeah. And, and there'll be people, like, who respond to us saying, like, that people don't care. Like, there'll, there'll be people who are, like, just don't go to gigs. There'll be people that's, like, it's in the pit. They're having fun. Get over it. But it takes two seconds to be, like, oh, I am standing on someone's foot. Mm. I should not do that. Yeah. And, like, when I saw the Pretty Reckless, the people in front of me, all of them just main characters. Yeah. <laughs> they were treading all over everyone, pushing... This is it. This is the thought process after COVID, and I'm all for romanticizing your life. Mm. You know, find joy in every little thing. But everyone just thinks, oh, this person's just an NPC. And yeah, that's a pet people peeve. don't actually think, oh, I'm ruining someone else's experience. They don't think like that anymore. There's been so many times I've been like going for a train or something, and I've had people push past me and go, these. Like, more than once. Oh, my God. Yeah. Touch grass, kids. <laughs> and anyway, yeah, pretty reckless. They were, like, jumping, jumping, jumping. They were jumping on my boot. I was trying to move. My boot's now ripped. Mm. I love that boot. <laughs> but then a completely different experience. I went to Leeds Fest a couple of years ago. We went to go see Peyton Pending in one of the smaller like pop-up tent things they have the big but they're not very big if they're packed 
me and yeah. Harry were quite close to the front. There was a mosh pit. We both got pushed over immediately before we even hit the ground. Someone had grabbed us and picked us back up. I went to Leeds Fest in, I think, 2010 or 11. I was at the offspring near the pit. Nobody even tried to get me in. Yeah. Granted, I was like two days off being 11 years old. <laughs> but, you know, it wouldn't have mattered to most like these days. These days, they would push a 10-year-old into a mosh pit. Yeah, like at Youngblood, we, were, we weren't we were particularly close, but we're sort of, you know, like the sweet spot in the middle where people like to, to pit. Yeah. Um, and people were like pushing out, making a pit when there's a visibly young girl with us and we did nearly get dragged in if it weren't for me and Harry sort of like putting his arms out to form the circle and like being a barrier between us and and my cousin we could have got hurt I mean the crowd went mild the mosh pits were very disappointing it was like a massive mosh pit and then four people in the middle so (laughs) it was a bit disappointing but I feel like if it were a proper mosh pit, we would have absolutely been dragged into it. And I know some people say, well, don't stand that fat at front. Don't stand that fat at front. But there'll be mosh pits wherever you are standing. Even right at the back, there's mosh pits. I've been to gigs where we've been literally at the back of the venue and people still mosh pit. I don't have a problem with moshing. Do you know what I mean? Like, we've we've been doing it for years. (laughs) Yeah. But it's the etiquette about it. People aren't as safe like yeah you go in you have a bit of fumble with people but again at Leeds Fest totally different experience when we got picked up and then a couple of hours later we saw royal blood and there was a guy in the middle of the mosh pit literally punching people like not even a uh, you know like a pretend fight soft punch he was literally full-on right hooking people looking for a fight And it completely ruined it. And we ended up having to move away because we were like, we are not getting involved in that. That, what you do in a mosh pit is you just nudge. Yeah, exactly. You sort of run into each other and shoulder barge and it's supposed to be fun. And Yeah, people get hurt. You You get a bit bruised, whatever. And, you know, you fall down, you get picked back up. But I feel like it's so different now. It. It's really easy to blame things on COVID, but is it COVID or is it just people? Yeah, But true. honestly, it just, it just takes a second to think, am I ruining this person's day? Yeah. You don't have to sit there through the whole show being like, oh God, oh God, I'm in the way, oh, oh, oh. But you just think, oh, that's a person, I'll just shuffle out the way a bit. Yeah, exactly. It costs literally nothing to be a nice human. Yeah, I think that's what we have, though. That's all of the show. Yeah, yeah, I don't have any more points. I think we've um, nicely chatted about them. Again, it's not as structured as last week, um, but I feel like this is what's going to happen when I'm in charge of episodes. I'm not <laughs> nearly as organised as Vicky at all. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can say that first episode, I'd been planning it for months. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'd say probably already like doing this I'm like okay there's things we can do differently for next month um but we're on episode two so we don't have to be perfect yet so that's good yeah um what month is it next April yes April we have I have two shows in April yeah who are you seeing um Phil's Vampire Killers with you on the first um, and then I feel like it's the 20th-ish. Um, I'm going to see Stone. We've mentioned Stone before. Such a good band. So excited. So I'm seeing Fearless Vampire Killers. I'm sure there's a second band I'm seeing, but it's gone from my head. <laughs> I have a very busy April. Yeah. <laughs> It might be theatre shows I'm seeing most of next month. It still shows, nonetheless. Is is it... I suppose we could talk about the theatre tunes. Yeah, the difference between... I mean, the etiquette in um, theatre has gone down. I've seen that a lot. Apparently, you're not allowed to sing in musicals, and I didn't know that. Yes, no, you're not. Um, so we went to see Hamilton, and it we were told not to sing. 
um in um is it we will rock you no yeah yes yes the queen one yeah um weren't allowed to sing I think the only exception was Rocky Horror. We've seen that a couple of times um, and we were allowed to sing. But yeah, I don't know if that's a new thing or I mean, it's always been the case. I used to sing along to pantomimes as a kid. I suppose you're not going to stop a kid, but now I'm going to see... I went to see American Idiot in 2019 and I was singing and yeah. everyone shouted at me. Um, we've also seen Battle of Hell. And the whole crowd was singing. Um, I sang very quietly to the Lion King. But no, apparently you're not allowed to sing. I yeah. suppose it's it's um, it's okay to have a little sing to yourself. Yeah, but, not, but I feel like it's the big group singing that puts out. the actors off, maybe. Yeah. Like, um, going back to actual concerts, have you seen that clip that's in the news about a Billie Eilish show? I'm not sure. Someone's, um, the, it was an article saying, like, this person's singing is ruined by show. And I clicked mm-hmm. onto it because I was like, are you just, like, being grumpy about people enjoying themselves? But no, this person isn't just singing along the, like, making it their show. Uh, enjoying it a little bit too much. Yeah, it's, it's, what, what's it called, like, when someone, like, warbles the, the song like oh like vibrato-ish yeah they were doing that in like every song even when billy weren't singing yeah and at that point then you're like yeah yeah best stop unless you want to get on that stage babe yeah <laughs> please stop if i was yeah. a singer and someone did that i'd be like right you want to do my job for you absolutely fuming <laughs> But yeah, I feel like that might be a good a good thing to even if it's just a short discussion between yeah. um, music and, and musical theatre. Yeah, so we can compare that next month. Yeah. I have I'm gonna be looking into going to see another orchestra soon. We can talk about that at some point. Yeah. Yeah, we're not just pop punk. <laughs> we have variety. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but yeah, um, as well as talking about Effie Kane Stone, I've not got the book on me that I wrote down the plan for every month because I have planned out every episode of this for the next year. <laughs> um, so we could either talk about the opening acts that we've discussed slightly, you know, yeah, open band supremacy, um, or slightly controversial. Ooh. Because uh, it's April Fools, we could talk about bands with allegations who you're a fool to listen to. Yes, I remember you uh, mentioning that. I feel like that would be a good one. I think we could get a guest on for that as well. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. So Very exciting. I might put a Twitter poll up. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, thank you for listening, everyone. Yes, thank we you, appreciate Tegan, it. for being the main host this month. I tried. <laughs> We're new to it, you know, it's learn as you go. And as always, thank you to Kathy for doing the Kathy show and Ooh. everyone that she's interviewed. Yep. Um, thank you to Kia for doing our artwork. And if you wanna like read my reviews, it's on Alt Corner and Love It to Death. If you wanna follow us, we're on Instagram, we're on Twitter. Thinking of making a TikTok? Ooh. Mm. Yeah, thank you for listening. Yeah, thank you, Tegan. You're very welcome. Thank you, Vicky. You're welcome. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Goodbye.